Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's a lovely turn of phrase that the ludic and subversive energies, and it's kind of something that I've always felt was very present in uh, popular popular kind of folklore in Ireland when I was growing up. There was a particular publication to which a lot of my generation subscribed, which was called Our Boys. It was published by the Christian Brothers, and uh, within the pages of that. Um, there was a serial written by an Irish-American, actually, called Victor O.D. Power. And uh, it was called The Adventures of Kitty the Hare, the traveling woman of Old Munster. And um, I lived in a small town on the, the border, which had kind of a different sort of mode of speech because of the um, particular ethnic mix, I suppose you would call it, along the, there's a more terse kind of speech. People wouldn't give you too much information. But the prose in The Travelling Woman of Old Munster was a, a lot more exciting to me. It was rococo, it was strange. It told you an awful lot, but you didn't know whether any of it was true or not. And it would begin with things like Moshe, it is a queer and terrible story, I have to tell you this night. And there was always a, <laughs> an odd peddler man or fellow with a suitcase arriving. And the hair used to stand at the back of my neck and think what this character was going to get up to, you know. And, uh, years later, as I, my kind of reading continued, mostly kind of comic books and, you know, pulp thrillers and things, I began to kind of write stories that were mixed up together, you know, like John Creasy and Raymond Chandler would somehow get all mixed up with this Victor O.D. power, musha, queer and terrible things. <laughs> and I kind of really got excited by the possibilities of that Congress, you know, that, and as I got older, I read Nabokov, who was saying things like, you know, ultimately a novel should be a phenomenon of language. And I suppose that's why when I discovered Joyce, I revered him, because it was like a ballad group and a great big orchestra striking up every time, depending on what page you turned. And uh, I suppose what I particularly liked about him was the crappy boy aspect of him, in that he was uh, unmistakably of a Catholic species. And by that I mean he was quite incontinent in ways, and that uh, <laughs> he might be very difficult to get out of the bar late at night because it'd be <laughs> another song, actually. Actually, if I have the time, I'd just like to tell a story I was sharing with Anne some months ago. I came upon a little booklet uh, which was published in the 30s called They Go, the Irish. Very hard to find now. I got it in a little secondhand shop, but there was a little monograph in it by an Irish governess who described being at a party or a little soiree, I suppose, in the provinces in France and halfway through this little soiree, just a few drinks and chat, this fellow was, came in by a side door or something and she noticed a lot of people were paying attention to this reed-like figure who couldn't seem to find his way around with a stick. There was a robust woman with him and uh, she was at the piano anyway later on, and this man in the spectacles arrived over and said, are you from Ireland? And she said, yes, I am. I've been teaching a little boy here now for some time. He said, oh, I'm from Ireland as well. I wrote a book uh, about it, but they didn't really like it, and it kind of saddened me greatly. But anyway, that's neither here nor there, he said. Do you like, you like, you're a very fine piano player. I'd like to sing a song if you wouldn't mind. And the woman said, you'll sing no songs. <laughs> and, uh, as is the way with people who have been married a long time, you just don't really listen to that. You just say, well, as I was saying, uh, the song I'm going to sing <laughs> is I'm off to Philadelphia in the morning. <laughs> and uh, I think it's a fine spirited work. Would you accompany me on it? And he set off, as you all know, I'm sure he had a fine tenor voice, and he sang the whole lot of I'm off to Philadelphia in the morning. And this governess finished off her octaves, 
to the sound of the robust woman saying, Jesus Christ Almighty. He spends three hours saying he's not coming out. Then when he eventually comes out, I can't get him to go home. <laughs> and he said, I'd better go now. He said, my name is James Joyce. It's really nice to meet you. <laughs> but anyway, back to the subversive and ludic energies of small town Ireland. <laughs> um, in the pages of our boys, there were constant manifestations of the supernatural, the entity, the floating spirits, and one of them was called the Fetch. Another that I use in this book, The Stress Out Country, is Nobo Daddy, who's a creation of William Blake's, it was father without a body, god figure, perhaps benevolent, perhaps benign, perhaps not. It was a cold, sharp morning in the year 1896. I was routinely referred to as the Fetch in those days, during a period when such concepts were rarely questioned. They wouldn't dare. The Fetch, they murmured in choked, odd whispers. Once you see him coming around, you're finished. Fetch, like Nobu Daddy, inscrutable director of souls and motivation. A laborer by the name of Hugh Considine had been working with some colleagues, building the new road that would lead from Collymore to Bala. Hugh Considine had lived in the district all his life. He was 27 years of age. He was a quiet sort of individual and well disposed towards work or physical exertion of any kind. Not that he was big, he was quite slight in fact, pale, angular and thin. He wielded his shovel on the tar road from dawn to dusk. This notable enthusiasm had the effect of prompting his somewhat less enthusiastic colleagues to have fun with him on occasion to take a hand out of him, as the colloquial expression went. Considine, they'd say. You're showing the rest of us up, so you are. If you don't let up, we'll have to do it. Give that wife of yours a wee bit of a seat. Considine lowered his head when he heard this. You see, the truth was that Hugh Considine was an extremely devout and holy man. And because of this, his fellow workers had established that taunts of a body or nature tended to be more effective than certain others they might have attempted. Initially, their friend and colleague prayed for the strength to withstand these quite unnecessary provocations. And for a considerable period, the various novenas and rosaries did, in fact, sustain him. But whether on account of the fact that he had been working too hard, or maybe due to the quite extraordinary physical beauty of his spouse, her long wavy hair into which she sometimes threaded rose petals, it cascaded all along her back. Well, anyway, it had arrived at the stage that all of this most definitely had begun to upset him. To the degree that he kept inquiring, having just arrived home, them boys in the road, do they be looking at you, Molly? Actually, your boys is boys, Molly replied. Unfortunately. <laughs> because that was not the response that her husband had anticipated. In Irish folklore, it is routinely asserted that access to the stray sod country is gained by means of the unholy gate. And that once you have reached it, you will find that you have been deceived. And that now you have arrived in a place where the world can never be the same again. 
your senses will have been overtaken by a heightened facility of observation, which can only result in the most unnameable terror of all, cosmic loneliness. Hugh Considine now found himself on the other side of that unholy gate. He sat rigidly at the kitchen table, staring straight ahead of him, like a somnambulist. He knew someone was trying to rob him of his reason. He could have sworn that someone touched his elbow, which was why he remained in a state of extraordinary agitation. And this was how affairs were set to continue. Again the following day, as he made his way along the Tar Road, he found himself the object of a vase of scorn from his fellow labourers, who were remarking on the curiously haunted and furtive manner with which he now carried himself, as if expecting to be waylaid at any moment. There are few sensations more distressing than that of being constantly under surveillance. His face was accentuated by an unnatural pallor. The air was soundless as Hugh Considine proceeded along the road. Through the boughs and sprays of the leafy elms, no sigh or motion was audible. He stared at his colleagues, but could identify no face that was familiar. That night in bed, he overheard a soft tapping. behind the wall directly above his head. He stared at his wife. She was sleeping and had heard nothing. The following night it came again, this time even softer. As he strode along the tar road the next day, he repeatedly applied his handkerchief to his forehead. Suddenly a soulless, unjoyous laugh broke out somewhere close by. Then he realised that it had issued from the lips of a fellow labourer, one who once upon a time would have qualified as an eminent friend and neighbour. But no longer. For like the others, he had been transformed into a featureless, unreachable foreigner strategically placed there for the purpose of deepening one's aloneness. The unholy gate had been firmly slammed shut, and Hugh Considine cried aloud, trembling violently as he did so. What are you all looking at me for? Why are you saying these awful things? Why are you telling these terrible lies? Even as he spoke the words, Hugh Considine knew that his entreaty was pointless. For all he knew, they were no longer even men. The laboring man on the spade close by had reacted to his outburst by simply laughing. but with a smile one might find on the face of it changely. As this thin smile extended and Hugh Considine heard him taunt, Boys, but she's the queer looking girl that way is. Eh? It was later that same evening when his wife Molly was leaning down to remove the griddle cake from the oven that Hugh Considine did his best to avoid the attractions of her fine, shapely haunches. As he stood in the doorway of their cabin with his shovel, seeming grave, looking ashen, in fact. What are you doing with that shovel, Hughie? his wife inquired, slapping her hands on her thighs as she approached him before adding, Did you have a good day on the tar road, working? 
replied her husband, smashing open her head with the iron implement. <laughs> Before helping himself to a hunk of griddle cake, looking down at her body as it lay there on the flagstones. There, um, there didn't appear to be any blood, he thought. as I stood there watching in the chimney corner shadows. That was in a different time. This is in the same small town in 1958, the year when the greater part of this narrative takes place, when a shadow fell across the frosted glass of a barber shop belonging to Patsy Murray at 8 a.m. in the morning. Patsy had been perusing the paper when he heard the softest tap on the glass. The barber found himself taken aback, having just sat down to enjoy a quiet rest to give his full attention to the crossword. But then he heard the tapping again, even more insistent. He crossed the floor hesitantly, gently tugging back the blind, describing to his astonishment, Blossom Foster, on the footpath outside. He swallowed hard, scarcely able to believe the sight that was meeting his eyes. But there could be no doubt about it. It was her, the bank manager's wife, waiting on his barber shop step, dressed in her leopard print coat and stole, looking huntedly about her. Drawing back, he watched as she tapped the glass again, but this time more firmly with her ring. I can't understand it, the barber gasped. It's hardly the time you'd come looking for my wife, Golly. Eight o'clock in the morning? His wife, Golly, had only departed 15 minutes earlier, bringing their son, Boniface, with her to Mass. Affording Patsy, or so he had thought, a rare opportunity to attend to his crossword and enjoy reading his newspaper without having to listen to his son's persistent questions. For Boniface, God love him, at times it could be a trial. An awful yapper. Was it any wonder that he got on Golly's nerves at times? That young fellow would try the patience of a saint, she often said. But Boniface now is the least of his worries. What should I do, he thought. He really was in a quandary. The truth, of course, being that he had always been uncomfortable talking to women, especially Protestants. who always appeared to be in possession of a greater sense of assurance and confidence about themselves. In a state of mounting agitation, the barber hovered precariously by the latch and realized that he was perspiring uncomfortably. The shop door swung open and a blast of cold air hit him. And he found himself staring into the face of Blossom Foster. He caught a glimpse of his own reflection in the glass. He was acutely pale. She, however, seemed quite at ease, behaving as though she'd been expected all along. May I come in? He heard her say. A request which was quite superfluous, for her foot had already crossed the threshold. She smiled as she stood beneath the framed photograph of Manchester United, tapping her nails on her fox forest vulpine head in a steady, even rhythm, as she said to Patsy, I was just up the town, leaving bodily into work, when I thought on my way back that perhaps I might pop in and see Patsy. For it's been on my mind. Yes, I have to talk to my old friend. 
Talk to me, replied the barber hoarsely. You kept thinking you had to talk to me. <laughs> yeah, she retorted. Yes, you, Patsy. Crinkling up her nose as she exuded a little shiver. That's what I remembered. That I have to pop in and have a chat with my favourite barber. <laughs> she lowered her eyes and then her voice. It's just that, you see, you're an expert hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> replied Patsy in a tone which suddenly had begun climbing the register until it was almost falsetto <laughs> and it embarrassed him deeply oh yeah I know it's unusual Blossom nodded but it's just that you see I had this extraordinary dream. Dream? An extraordinary dream, you tell me, Blossom. Hmm. Yes, Patsy. An extraordinary dream that I was in Monique's. Just chatting away as we always do, as usual. But then, all of a sudden, I felt these strong, warm hands on my neck. And I looked up to see, to become aware that it wasn't Monique who was cutting my hair at all. It wasn't her, Patsy. Was it not? It wasn't Monique. <laughs> no, dear. Because it was you. Isn't that the most... Isn't that the funniest thing? I really do think it is most extraordinary. But do you know what was even stranger, Patsy? Do you know what I was saying to you as there you were just clipping away? Maybe that you were in the wrong place. <laughs> I'm in the wrong place, Patsy, maybe. Is that perhaps what you might have been saying? No. <laughs> Patsy, I wasn't saying that at all. What I was saying was... Patsy, you really are the most wonderful barber. <laughs> the best. Top class. <laughs> no one in Cullymore could ever hope to match you. Or anywhere else either. Then, quite dramatically, she coughed and switched the subject. What do you think of this Cold War, Patsy? <laughs> hmm? <laughs> I don't know, replied the barber. I really wouldn't have any opinion of it. paused as his face grew markedly flushed. To tell the truth, it was now a deep scarlet. Why, uh, what would your opinion, Blossom, of it be? <laughs> he formed the impression that this remark had amused her considerably. Oh, you men, she chuckled with a girlish impishness. You know, 
you really can be such sillies at times. You really can be the silliest of sillies. But there's only one silly I care about, Patsy. Blossom turned her back and lit a senior service. Patsy, she asked, would you like a cigarette? <coughs> no, thank you, replied the barber. I'm only after putting one out, so I am. <laughs> Do you know something, dearie, his visitor went on, as a wreath of blue smoke lolled directly above her head. Before I came down, I was listening to the wireless. I was listening to the wireless, and guess who was on? I don't know, Blasm. Who, who was on? Alistair Cook. <laughs> Alistair Cook, all the way from America. <laughs> Talking about the way things have gone in the world. Hmm. It's terrible, so it is, Patsy replied, although the words had in fact departed his lips before he could give them any proper consideration. You know, Patsy, he says that all over in these current times, there are people who lie on their beds awake, worrying that they find themselves lying there at all hours of the night, fretting and agitating that it's all going to end, that everything they have worked for their whole lives will come to nothing. And as shadows of our former selves, we'll be desolate. Oh, people do fret. There's no denying that, agreed Patsy. You'd feel sorry for them, so you would, some of the things that get into their heads. It would remind you of times of the stray sod. The stray sod? What's that, Patsy? I can't say I ever heard tell of that. Nothing. It was silly of me to mention it, Blossom. It's stupid, the stray sod country. Old wives' tales is all it is. Oh, yeah, said Blossom. You would feel sorry for them, though, wouldn't you? All those people worrying and sighing night after night about this silly old cold war. There ensued a lengthy pause, and then at last Blossom Foster slowly turned with her eyes still lowered, contemplating her varnished pink fingernails as she, with measured composure, slowly began to raise her head with a smile. Her voice was lower now, even huskier. But me, I'm different to them. I was wondering, perhaps, do you know what I mean, Patsy? Y yeah. <laughs> yes, Blossom, I think I do. <laughs> He replied, falteringly, because it wasn't true. In fact, he hadn't a clue what she meant. <laughs> she sloped her foot and extended her toe to its full length, and having inspected it for a moment or so, began to move slowly across the floor, as though negotiating a path through the small and disparate hillocks of shorn air. She was approaching him now steadily. Oh, I couldn't be bothered worrying, she said, about atomic experiments or anything else. I couldn't even be bothered, in fact, about space, she said. <laughs> space? <laughs> answered Patsy, quite dumbfounded. 
here. Space explained Blossom. On the wireless, Mr. Cook said that some people, even people in high up places, are of the opinion that the Russians and the Americans ought to leave space alone. <laughs> and not be sending these capsules up there at all. <laughs> capsules? Um, Sputniks, is it? Sputnik. <laughs> yeah, Sputniks, if you want to call them that. But I think he meant any kind of rocket, really. Any kind of rocket blossom, yeah? Yeah, just rockets, Patsy. Yeah. Just any, any old kind of rocket. I mean, let's face it, Mr. Murray, space is enormous. <laughs> I mean, what I'm saying is that it's absolutely vast. Who knows what they might find out there? Then there's always the other, t the other thing, as Mr. Cook says. The other thing, said Patsy. The other thing, the fear, I mean, that you might never get home. If you went out there into space, you might never come home after all those thousands of millions of miles. Imagine that. Oh, God. I heard them talking about it on the telly. Yeah. That you might be left there for years, for centuries. Something went wrong with the capsule, maybe Blossom, if the engine blew up. <laughs> and you'd be out there marooned. Why, it doesn't even bear thinking about. Not for the likes of you and me anyway. The likes of you and me that have families. Oh, God, you'd be thinking about them all the time. You'd have to get home at all costs, Blossom. Family is important. <laughs> Worst is, it's the most important thing in the world, dearie. And Catholic or Protestant, it simply doesn't matter. For at the end of the day, everyone's the same. Of course they are, Patsy, for that's the way their creator made them. She exhaled some smoke, crushing a moat of fluff between her thumb and index finger. Patsy, dearest, do you know what really makes me mad, she said. Barbara shook his head again, averting his eyes. She blew some smoke and said, people saying unchristian things about the Pope. <laughs> things. What kind of things, Blossom? What kind of things? Well, things like that he isn't a proper leader at all. That a proper leader is someone who represents reliable, decent, hardworking people. Those, you might say, who are genuinely godly. <laughs> Have you ever overheard anyone saying that? <laughs> she lifted her cigarette and stared directly at him. The fragrance of her scent was making him feel faint now. The only other lady's perfume he'd really experienced before was that of his wife. And golly never wore it now, not much. Its sheer intensity overwhelmed him. I wonder will we see him when we go over there to Rome. His holiness, I mean. Rome? What? stammered the barber. I don't understand, Mrs. Foster. Blossom flicked some ash off her cigarette and smiled. Oh, for heaven's sake, don't call me that. Oh, but I'm sorry, didn't I tell you? Myself and Hubby are going there again this year. Do you think the Pope would mind if two old Protestants came to see him in St. Peter's Square? <laughs> I'm joking, of course. Of course he wouldn't, Patsy, because none of that silliness matters anymore. Now that it's the 1950s, everyone's the same, no matter what their religion is. Of course certain people are still stuck in their ways. You'll hear some people going on about the coronation, praising Her Majesty to the heights and all the rest. Oh, there's no one better than the Queen, they'll say. <laughs> Which might have been true in the bygone days of empire. 
but not now. <laughs> no. Nowadays, your people are every bit as good as ours. <laughs> And if there once was an empire where people looked up to Her Majesty, the Windsors and all the other royals, well that, I'm afraid, is all over now. It's all over, Patsy, because where we are living is the modern world. Everyone has got the same chance now. As I was only saying to Hubby last evening, all that's left of the olden days now are the odd little bits and pieces you might find lying about the house, such as imperial leather soap, Patsy, or Darjeeling tea. She paused and just teased some discarded hair with her toe, meticulously moving it across the faded linoleum. Um, tell me, Patsy, uh, if you don't mind, does Golly use imperial leather? Patsy replied hesitantly that he didn't really know. I, I always use it, she said. To be perfectly honest, I wouldn't even entertain the idea of using anything else. She tapped her senior service and paused, holding him fixedly with her gaze, elevating her right eyebrow. Bewilderingly, Patsy found himself on the verge of erupting into laughter of a completely unrestrained nature. Would you not blossom? He asked her before red-faced adding, I wouldn't know all that much about soap. <laughs> blossom smiled as she plied her bracelet of white seed pearls. Of course you wouldn't, Patsy. Especially not about imperial leather. Because that, of course, would be more of a woman's soap. Now it was her turn to avert her eyes. Still teasing the pearls as she said to the barber. Patsy, do you ever tell her that she looks like a film star? Do you ever say that to Golly, I wonder, to your lovely wife? Tell her she looks like what? Like a film star? Is that what you said, Mrs. Foster? Did you say that to tell her look like what? A film star? <laughs> yeah. Like Jane Russell, maybe. Or Lauren Bacall. <laughs> what I'm saying is, did you ever look into your wife Golly's eyes and say to her, Dearest, if you don't mind me saying it, there are times when you remind me of the lovely Jane Russell. <laughs> Patsy Murray choked Jane Russell. He said, uh, hmm, perhaps Jane Russell, but not necessarily. Elizabeth Taylor, maybe, or Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> There are lots of other stars it could be. Stars of the stage and the Hollywood screen. She hesitated before continuing. Would you mind very much, Patsy, dear, if I told you something? I don't know, Blossom. I really couldn't say. Not until I heard it, I wouldn't know. There was something really deeply unsettling about her smile. As if for the briefest of moments it wasn't Blossom Foster who was standing there at all. As she said softly, Imagine if it was you and me who happened to be up there. Right up there on that silver screen. In a world famous film. Roman Holiday, for example. <laughs> Roman Holiday. Yeah. Roman Holiday with Audrey Hepburn. Sometimes I think that your wife looks like her. Does she really? I wouldn't know. I'm not even, I'm not even sure who Audrey Hepburn is, Mrs. Foster. <laughs> Blossom, Patsy. Blossom, please, dear. 
She was standing right beside him now, her warm, gloved hand cradling his elbow. Patsy Murray's heart was beating furiously and his cheeks were on fire. The curls of smoke from Blossom's cigarette went drifting idly in the direction of the frosted window. There was a certain remoteness apparent in his visitor now, but along with it a sense of determination and purpose, effortlessly freighting its manipulative cargo. Will you do me a favor, love, she said. Will you tell her I called? <laughs> Who, Blossom? Who, Blossom? Who, Blossom? <laughs> Mrs. Murray, of course. Of course I will, Mrs. Foster. Oh, I told you not to call me that. Certainly, Blossom, of course I'll tell her. I'll tell her that surely, if that's what you... But he never got round to completing the sentence for his early morning visitor had already departed. As the barber's shop door suddenly burst open, Damn you to hell! screeched Patsy Murray at his wife. 